Lisa Howdy, you are a senior vice president and the director of interior design at LK Architecture in Wichita, Kansas, found at lkarchitecture.com. Welcome to Listening with Leaders. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. I know you've had a, a, a really long career, but how did you get started in the, in the interior design business? Oh, gosh. Um, I was in high school and just got super intrigued, didn't even realize that was something to get into, um, convinced a, a lady to hire me. She was a designer in Houston, had a residential firm, convinced her that she needed an assistant and uh, fell in love, kind of got the bug and went from there. So, yeah. And then, um, you know, you went, you went on at one point, you started your own firm in Houston. Tell us about that. I did. I had my own firm. It was um, PDG Studios, formerly known as Paradigm Design Group. I had it for 20 years. Um, started the company pretty much because I kind of wanted to do my own thing. And and I I knew that I knew I had more in me. I knew that I had an entrepreneurial spirit. I was kind of it was also kind of a challenge um, to some extent in the beginning. Um of like, oh, you'll never do that. And then I'm one of those that, you know, let's just keep raising the bar and do more. Um, so I started my own firm and uh, rode the wave and did great things and kept building up and really kind of found my niche in the lifestyle brand of of the world and hospitality and loved it. Um, really enjoyed it. It was a time though, at the end, towards the end, it was time for me to sell it. I kind of was a little bit burned out, a little bit trying to find myself again, and just felt like I needed a break um, from all of that, but then quickly realized after a few months that was really not the case, and I really do love what I do, um, but it was a really, actually, it was a really good learning point for me, I think, ultimately, because now the position I'm at here at LK, I have a whole different perspective and it's taking all those 20 years of lessons learned of what to do, what not to do, all the hard knocks of running your own company and, and everything that goes with it, um, and kind of taking the best of the best. And um, now creating a department that basically is just like running my own company to some level, um, but really embracing it, being that good mentor, being that good leader learning from all those past mistakes and um, moving forward. And it is fun. I love my team. Um, we're in a growth mode right now. So I'm also building out, you know, potentially a second office. And uh, I, I really do enjoy um, working with the president of our firm. He's kind of a mentor to me as well. Uh, and it's just nice to have someone to bounce those ideas off. You don't feel like you're an isolated island. Um, but at the same time, it's also really nice when you have HR issues, you just go hand it over to HR. If you have accounting issues, you hand it over to accounting. Like, I don't have to wear that hat anymore, um, which is really nice. So, and so it sounds like you, haven't, you haven't had a hard time transitioning from owning your own business and being the boss to now mm -hmm. being in a company where you're not the boss. I mean, you're a very senior person in LK architecture, but you're not the boss. And, and it right. sounds like it, that doesn't bother you one bit. <laughs> nope. Um, no, it's nice. I, and, you know, partly too, I mean, I have, I'm a single mama and so it's hard, you know, I need a village to kind of help take care of everything. And it is nice to be able to say when it is weekend, I can turn that off a little bit more than if you own the company. Um, and I can spend that time with my daughter, you know, I only have a few more years before she goes to college. And so it is nice to be able to have that kind of balance a little bit more. Um, not to say I'm still not the workaholic I am, but <laughs> but of all the, in, of all the things that you do, what do you enjoy doing the most in your work? Oh gosh, um, well I love design. That's obviously something I'm passionate about, so that's obviously one of my favorites. Um, I love the people, people as in my team. I adore my team, um, and also the the people I work with, the the clients that we have. I really do enjoy that connectivity. Um, you know, design is is a very subjective element, right? To some extent, either you like it or you don't, my opinions, whatever. And when we're designing, it's not like you're designing for your home. You're designing for a space, especially um, here with hotels or 
restaurants or whatever, you're, you're thinking about all the patrons that are going to be in that space. Um, if it's a non-branded property or a branded property, I should say like a Marriott or a Hyatt, you know, we have rules we have to follow as well. So you're taking all that into place, but there's a level of creativity that comes out of it. That is just really fun. It's like thinking outside the box, thinking bigger, broader, better, um, I'm always competitive with myself and raising the bar and raising the bar some more. Um, but I just enjoy the people. I enjoy the process. I enjoy that interaction um, and just really, you know, being collaborative with my team and getting to the roots of what we are that we're trying to get to. Excellent. And what is it that you think is unique that you bring to the table? Um, oh, gosh. Um, let's see. I I probably drive my team bananas because I am not a um I'm probably a bit more unexpected at times, right? They they when they probably think they figured me out, I'll throw curveballs at them and I'm always pushing them a bit further. Like think outside the box or I'm roping them back in a little bit. Um so yeah, I probably drive them bananas. That, that's, um, what, that's what makes you unique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, the other thing I would say, oh gosh, I don't know. I never think of it that way. I would just say probably to um, my leadership style is probably a little bit different. I'm much more, I very much in, embrace collaborativeness. I very much embrace, we are a team. It is not a, a group of I, you know, we definitely need to work together in that approach. Um I like to encourage people to step out and, and, you know, really kind of, I push them a lot and that's probably, that's hard to do. I think as a leader, because sometimes, you know, you want to micromanage it and I'm probably not the one that's going to micromanage. I, I want them to be able to stand on their own two feet, but I also want to be there as their mentor. And, um, I would say the other thing is, um, maybe it's my mom instincts in me, but my team, you know, they're all my little babies. Like I definitely go to bat for them. I definitely stand behind them. Um, very supportive of them, you know, personal life, professional life. Um, I try to encourage them. I mean, again, it's, I think it's just that nurturing element as a mama, but, um, it, is your, is your team yeah. mostly younger people. I mean, like 10 or 15 years younger than you. No. Mm -mm. No, I have a mix. I have a mix. I have one person that's actually a smidge older than I, believe it or not. Um, very, we're very close in age, but, um, but we all, we all have different experiences. We've all been through different parts of our life. And, um, so I have a mix of ages, um, which I think is great. And I think it keeps me humble. Um, and I think it also helps balance a little bit because I think you do need um, a little bit of everybody's life experiences to some extent that uh, definitely, you know, keeps us on our toes. Actually, I, I should correct that. I have two people that are older than me now that I think about it. <laughs> so, which is good I, and, you know, keeps you on your toes. So part of, part, of, part of what you do and what you really enjoy is the collaborative aspect of working with your team. And yeah. the thing that I hear that you get really excited about is mentoring people. And yeah. They're not so happy to grow. Maybe you force them to grow a little faster than they want to grow. But <laughs> you know, you know what they need and yeah. you're, you're willing to give it to them. And at the yeah. end, of the day, they love you, yeah. follow you. Yeah. Right. And I love design. I mean, I just, I just do. I mean, for me, you know, everything is inspiration. Um, I think, um, again, I probably drive them bananas because my brain doesn't really turn off. Um, I'm always thinking, always pushing, always um, wanting, you know, there is a pencil down moment for sure because you you have to stop design to some level because you got to get it documented. But um, when you're trying to figure out the concepts, that definitely is something I love doing and and love working with them about it. So, so for people who don't know what design is, maybe you could take a moment and kind of give us a, a quick tutorial on on what design is all interior design is all about. I, just by by way of information, I grew up in a family that owned a furniture chain, and my mother was an interior designer, residential. So right. I grew up with right. That. Anyways, a lot of people don't know what it, it's. It's a really quite right. fascinating and complex. 
process. It is. And kudos to those that do residential. Um, I don't have the patience for residential. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, we're the ones that make everything look pretty. But at the same time, especially on the commercial side of things, it is also very technical. And there's a lot, you know, people think that the design, the actual selections, the, the pretty side of it is what we do most of the day, but that's only like probably 10%, you know, the rest of it is very technical and detailed and um, lots of parts and pieces to it. Um, but design is, you know, think about everything your touch, feel and see in your space. You know, we have a part, we are in charge of that. Um, and you know, a lot of it is also what is that experience you're going to have visually, mentally, sense-wise, et cetera. You know, it's, it's the whole kit and caboodle. And so if um, I walk into a hotel lobby, somebody has designed that hotel lobby. Yep. And it's going to evoke a certain experience, certain emotions, certain yep. uh, experiences. And the designers are the ones who are responsible for creating all of that to evoke yep. the owner of the property that wants to. Yes. Have happened. Yes. Yes. And, you know, as my love is the lifestyle boutique type properties, you know, and um, for me, it's always like, how do we make that extension of what you, the comforts that you feel at home, right? You want that to be in your space that you're going to. But then in addition to that, if I'm in Seattle, I want to feel like I'm in Seattle. If I'm in Hawaii, I want to feel like I'm in Hawaii. I don't want it to feel like it's a box that could be anywhere USA. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think for me, I love the lifestyle side of it so much because I'm that little researcher that's going to go try to find those odd duck little things that nobody knows about. And how do I incorporate that into this design, whether in your face or subtly? Um, and there's all different things that we'll do, you know, to do that. But especially when you get into some of those locations that are like really hard to like kind of crack and figure out how do you create this design? If you're going into Nashville or even the stockyards in Dallas, that is a very distinct look. You can carry that in. That's fine. But then what do you do when you're in like the middle of South Dakota? Like, how do you, how do you create some unique element to that? Um, so those are those, that's where I, I feel like that's where my passion comes in. Cause it's a, that's a, the ability to research, it's the ability to design, it's the ability to, to just think a little bit differently. Sometimes you have to stretch really deep to find it. Um, and you know, get where we need to go. So you get, do you get to do a lot of actual design research yourself? I do. Yeah, I do actually do quite a bit of it. Um, I, when I do a project, I really like to um, collaborate with my team. So I, I ask usually whoever's on that team when we start the process, you know, okay, you here's what our design is, or here's where our location is. You go do your research. I'll do my research. So-and-so, you do your research. And let's all like regroup in a couple of days and see what we've come back with. And it's kind of, it's fun when you do it that way, because everyone brings different things to the table. Like I sometimes might go focus on food or florals or whatever might be in that area and like okay how do we bring that into the design maybe that inspires the color maybe that inspires the pattern or something um but each of us brings something else to the table and I think it's really fun to just kind of see to dig a little deeper and it's not just the typical things you're going to see all the time it sounds really, it sounds really creative a really creative process yeah, that's the fun part. The not so fun part sometimes is, you know, the technical side of it. But and, and when, then you, there's... when you're talking about the technical side, I mean, <clears throat> when you're dealing with public spaces, you've got all kinds of compliance issues you've got to worry about. And Right, right. And then, too, there's there's a heavy level of documentation that we do as well. I mean, you know, drawing set could be lots and lots and lots of pages of drawings and specs and all of that, which, again, I'm one of those like I if you ask me to go write FF and E specs, I am like happy as a clam because that I love doing that component. But if you ask me to go sit and draw for a while, I go bananas after about two hours. Yeah. But you're, um, drawing, you're drawing up plans and specifications for the contractor to, to be able to execute. Correct. Yep. So it can all, so our vision can totally be implemented in. So that, that takes a lot of, a lot of little technical details, but 
again, which is why it takes a team because everyone brings different things to the table. And some people are going to be those amazing technical little drawers and drafters. And um, they do magic with that. Others are going to be do magic with the spec writing and um, others are going to be more visionary. So between all of us, we create a great outcome. Do you get to go, do you go out on jobs much? Yes. Yep. It's part of the process. We typically will go out several times and we definitely are out there at the very end um, to make sure what we envisioned is what we end up with. Um, some of my favorite times to go to the job site is at the very, very beginning of the job site when everyone is all trying to you know, be in the vision. And then at the very end, and I love seeing the response from ownership when they, when they actually physically walk the space, like they've been looking at renderings and they've been looking at drawings for months on end. I mean, these projects last for 18, 20, 24 months or longer. Um, but then when you finally walk it and they're like, wow, like this is, this is incredible. Um, you not, you know, you completely exceeded our expectations kind of things. To me, that is, the best part. It's just fun Absolutely. to see that outcome. So uh, I am sure that in your business, you run into messiness every now and then. Yeah. People get messy. How do you manage people messiness? <laughs> that's the way I describe it now. I think that, that just, that's better than the more clinical terms might use as a peacemaker. People messy. Yeah. Um. You know, yes, life is messy. Um. I think I think it boils down to owning up to your mistakes first and foremost. So if you are part of the reason why that messy miss was created, owning up to it. Um, secondly, I think it's really listening to what the problem is to get to the root of it and figuring out what is the best way to resolve it. Again, if you made the mistake, then own up to it and say you made the mistake. If it's a process, if it's a um, clash in personalities or whatever, just it's communication. It's having those conversations um, and, you know, kind of working through, through the process. Um, for the most part, you know, I'm not gonna say we're perfect because we're not. Um, so, we're, I mean, every project has its own little form of messiness in it to some extent, you know, some are more so than others. And some, some jobs, I swear to God, are just on some ancient burial ground that is just going to be torture the whole way through. Um, and those are the ones that are tough because it's like, every time you turn around, you feel like there's one more thing that just keeps hitting the wall and you're like, oh my gosh, like, how is it possible that this can continue to happen? But it does. Um, I think you just have to trudge through and, and, you know, kind of deal with the problems as they come up with it. Don't sweep them under the rug and just kind of keep moving forward. Um, one of the things I, this was a big learning curve for me, but something I've implemented, um, is that you have to analyze every project after the project. And, and it might even be sometimes as you're going through the processes, when we finish up a certain phase, uh, it's a great opportunity. I call them after after action reports. It's an opportunity for the team to kind of get together. And I usually send out a list of questions, make them all kind of review those questions and respond to them before we have our meeting. And it's a the time where we can just give the constructive criticism, kind of a, a benchmark, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, of what, what's going well, what's not going well, what do we need to shift and change on. Um, just because, you know, we want to try to avoid the messiness the whole way through. I mean, again, we're human, we make mistakes, um, but this is a great way to kind of teach, to learn, um, to evaluate what's going on, what's working, what's not working, and what do we need to adjust as we continue to move forward. Uh, I have found the more times I implement this, the better. And I also find my team gets stronger, you know, because we're also you know, owning up to the mistakes we've made. I mean, we're human. There's times when we're just gonna, you know, not be on a hundred percent. Who knows why you could have been sick for half the time, who knows, but there's just things that, you know, you just have to kind of say, um, this is how, this is what we're experiencing and this is how we need to fix it. So let's pivot to listening in this whole process. It sounds to me like listening is pretty critical. Yeah. Tell me yeah. Um, well, you know, for me, 
I very much am an active listener. Um, I'm a note taker galore. I'm constantly writing notes and taking notes. For me, that's how I remember things as well. It's the, I've saw it, I've seen it, wrote it down. It's now ingrained in my brain. Um, I think that, you know, you have to be focused. You cannot be multitasking. A lot of people will sit there and say, oh, I'm on a conference call, but they're also doing like seven other things at the same time. Um, you can't, you, you have to, you have to be engaged. Um, I know my daughter will accuse me at times that I'm not being the active listener and I'm just going through the motions. It's also coming from a teenager, but, uh, with that being said, you know, I do try to make a very conscientious effort to be listening and truly listening to what somebody is saying. Um, that's important. And, and listening is also paying attention to their body language, paying attention to, uh, how they're responding to you. Um, and just, you know, either they're engaged or they're not. And if they're not, you know, maybe it's the, now is not the time to continue that conversation, um, for whatever reason. So, um, how do you keep yourself from getting distracted? <laughs> um, I mean, really, because when we're listening, especially if, Somebody's kind of going on and on and on and on. It can get a little boring and just right, and, you know, right. Want to go off somewhere else, and now, now all of a sudden, we're not paying attention. How do you, how do you prevent that? Right. Um. Ooh, that's a good question. Sometimes, if someone does get distracted and they go off in their roundabout ways of a conversation, which probably is why my daughter complains at times because she'll do the roundabout conversation. Um, sometimes you have to interject a little bit and just redirect, um, mm -hmm. or ask specific questions or, um, even just, uh, you know, just pause and stop. It's okay to pause and stop. It's okay to have silence for a few seconds to redirect and think, um, I think engaging too, and being human, being authentic is important. Um, not just giving lip service of a generic answer, but truly answering a question, even if it's a hard one. Do you find that the processes that you use with your team are the same as the processes when you're in a meeting with your peers, the other senior executives of LK Architecture, or, or do you see a different, the, the president or CEO running a little slightly different process than what you run? Um, no, I would say Steve and I joke about this often. We're very aligned in how we, um, think things through business wise. And, you know, he took over as president of the firm a year ago. And one of the first things he gave us was a, a piece of paper that he said, this is what I want all of my leaders to do. And he gave this to the entire, all directors and, and VPs. So it wasn't just the senior team. Um, but he basically outlined, you know, an empathetic leader and what that looks like and how we should be running our day to day. And um, that in itself, when I saw that just reinforced, we we're on the same page you know, and, and how we operate. That's really interesting. What is, how did he define an empathetic leader or did he? He did. Um, actually I have, I still have the paperwork, um, pull it up because, um, you know, these are his, his things. And he said, I would like to see every employee and, and every person adapt to this as a principle. And I know I've shared this with my team, but I also try to live it every day. Um, acting with integrity at all times, leading by example, encouraging others to grow, being aware of your own actions or inaction and how that affects others, having a very strong vision, being good at what you do, always striving to do your best, develop an attitude of continual improvement every day, learning from your mistakes, finding a mentor, understanding your own motivations, engaging in honest and open communication, keeping a positive attitude, caring about your team department and your company, empowering your team and overall practicing empathy at all times. Interesting. 
And I, again, that's music to my ears, you know, and here this was, I started at LK a year ago. So this was a month in to me being employed there. And I was like, wow, this, this sums up my vision, my thoughts, my practice, my beliefs. Um, so for me, it's very natural to, to, in you know, use that on a daily basis. And so I, I love that this comes from the top down and that is the principles that, you know, he's encouraging that the whole firm actually practice as well. And do you think that the whole firm is beginning to practice all of these different values? I think so. I mean, it takes a while, obviously, for everyone to kind of fall into that um, mantra. But I think that we are on that path. I think that, you know, people are seeing um, what leadership is and what that looks like and how um, when you engage in that environment or in that way of thinking, how it truly does create a positive outcome. You know, you, you want to go to work, you're happy to go to work. Um, not to say you don't have bad days, you still do, uh, or things pop up. I mean, again, we're human, life happens. That's in this, right? But, yeah. I mean, it is what it is, but, but at the same time, I mean, it's, 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 it's that integrity, um, I'm again, I'm one of those. I'm always raising the bar. I always want to do better. I always I'm a bit competitive at times because of that. I'm competitive with myself. I expect better. Um, but I think there's a balance to that. And I think by having that positive outcome and and outlook with others is a good thing. And um, and there you find, at least for me, I feel like my team wants to do better and continues to work harder and and make that happen. How much of that do you bring home for your daughter? Oh gosh, she would tell you 110%. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, she knows, I mean, she, she knows I have high expectations. I think that, you know, she's in that borderline of she'll be going to college in a couple of years and um, she's seeing the outcome of that. She's seeing what that hard work looks like. You know, she's going into a very competitive field and uh, she's also seeing the benefits of kind of following that that practice um, and what that does and how that looks. So well, good. it's good. I have one more question for you. Sure. Um, what's one thing about yourself that we would never know unless you revealed it to us? <laughs> um, I don't know if I should say this or not, but it's kind of comical because it is very front and center right now. So my uh, ID coordinator uh, who works in our department has a great sarcastic, sarcastic type sense of humor. And I use the phrase, I don't curse very often, but I use the phrase, you know, Lord love a duck all the time. If I get frustrated with something, that's usually the phrase that comes out of my mouth. So with my uh, recent promotion and I have an upcoming birthday with a significant number to it that I'm not embracing. <laughs> she, has, uh, she has decided to reach out to all sorts of friends and foe um, to kind of send these elements to my office. So it kind of started, uh, it just started showing up. So I'm, I swear to God, I'm getting an Amazon package or two daily and there's some sort of duck mantra to it that is showing up in my office. Um, I've had everything from duck ice cubes containers show up to socks, to t-shirts, to posable ducks that you can make the mood of the day. I mean, it's now it's a running joke. It's comical. So, um, I, I'm not saying I'm the lover of all ducks and that I wanted 52,000 ducks in my office, but it is now becoming a running joke and it's really funny. And um, I have no idea what's going to happen over the next, you know, 30 days. Um, but because my birthday doesn't actually happen till end of May. So I have a feeling this is going to carry on for a good 30 days. <laughs> but uh, so that is something you definitely would not know um, no, unless no, you walk no. in my office. So it's, <laughs> That's it's great. Well, and I she's also the sarcastic one at Christmas time that put 100 baby ducks in my office. Really? So. You know, it's, fun. Nice, it's nice to know that you're appreciated and loved. <laughs> and I have a good sense of humor. <laughs> well, 
Thank you so much for your time, Lisa. I've really enjoyed the conversation with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Absolutely.